Hey everybody, welcome. Welcome to a place you probably haven't been before. This is the Tebbs Bend Battlefield. This is my first time here as well, and we're continuing our uh, sort of focus on battles that would be overshadowed by other larger battles. We've already been uh, to the Battle of Richmond, which is really taking place at the same time as the Battle of Second Manassas. We'll hopefully before long be at Munfordville. Oh man, Antietam's going to overshadow this, and this battle is fought largely on July 4th, 1863. Let's think. Did other things happen on July 4th, 1863? Sounds like Gettysburg and Vicksburg to me. But man, that doesn't mean we shouldn't study it. That doesn't mean you shouldn't come here. We are in Kentucky and we are lucky to have not only a member of our youth leadership team with us, Taylor Bishop, but also someone who happens to be from these parts. Family goes way back in these parts and um, is is also, um, I lost my train of thought there, but don't worry about it. Uh, he's, he's not only on our team, and I want to say that for a second, but also happens to know about this battle. The American Battlefield Trust, we have a field trip fund, which has sent tens of thousands of students to battle fields. We have a whole generations events where parents can bring their kids to that. Once COVID ends, we'll be doing a lot more of that. And we have had more than 9 million kids, students visit our website in the last year. So we do a lot as we can, but our youth leadership team is our sort of our signature program where we get a very small group, 10, 15 high school students to come with us, help advocate and learn about preservation um, and then perform goods back in their own communities. And Taylor Bishop uh, here has uh, gone to the Perryville battlefield. Uh, he has taken his YLT experience and brought it there, and now he's working with the Friends of Perryville Battlefield, and we're just really happy for what all these young people are able to do. He's a junior in high school right now, having an interesting COVID experience, so with no further ado, let's bring on Taylor Bishop, who, you know, where are we and why should we care about this battlefield? Hi, right, how do you do, ladies and gentlemen? My name is Taylor Bishop. I am from Greene County, which is just right across the way from over there. Um, so... You know, I really and truly want you all to come out here because this battle is such an important story here in Kentucky and for the United States in itself, in my opinion. Um, you're going to have some crazy numbers for the Federals and crazy numbers for the Confederates. It's uh, July of 1863, and John Hunt Morgan's raiding through Kentucky. Uh, his goal is to end in Ohio somewhere, you know, as soon as we'll figure out later on. And so he's going to be coming up through Kentucky with about 2,000 hardened Confederate veteran who are all cavalrymen. And he's going to meet a small force of about 170, that's right, 170 Federals who are all green, by the way. And this is their first battle under the 25th Michigan under the command of Colonel Orlando H. Moore. And if you can believe it, that 170-man force is going to whip John Hunt Morgan's 2,000 Confederate force out here at Perryville. Okay, that's, that's great, Taylor. Way to go, man. This is the future Ed Bars, I think, right going on right here. Um, so, you know, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about, I mean, this is not Hunt, John Hunt Morgan's first raid, you know, um, into the area. It seems like it was there the year before. I mean, some of these raids didn't go well, <laughs> you know, um, you know, resulting in some bad things for Morgan, I would say. But before we even get into that, what are, what are some of the things when you're raiding in through, you know, enemy territory, what are you trying to accomplish? So, I mean, being a Kentuckian, you're going to know a whole lot about John Hunt Morgan and what he's doing in Kentucky. And the big thing that John Hunt Morgan wants to do in any kind of raid is destroy as much federal supplies as he possibly can, capture as many federals as he possibly can, because it adds prestige to his character. And another big thing is destroy huge railroad bridges or bridges like over here at Green River Bridge at Tebbs Bend. It slows down an army, their supply wagons, their troop movements, stuff like that. That's basically what you want to accomplish here in a raid. And this is what's going to happen here during the big Great Raid of 1863. Okay, great. Let's just keep it going then. So, so here he is. Um, it's July 1863. Um, this is, I guess, early in that raid, uh, from what I can tell. And, you know, what are the Union dispositions? Where, where's the Union camp and, and who is where? And are the Union expecting an attack? So there's about, at Tebbs Bend on July 4th, there's about 266 Federals here. Uh, they had spent the night uh, through July 1st through the 3rd, same time the Gettysburg's going on. Uh, and these fields over here behind it, behind us, basically, kind of Chris is kind of panning right over here. These fields, as you can see, right over here, uh, further back on, that's where the camp of the 25th Michigan is camping for those three nights until July 4th, till they move to these bluffs over here. Uh, for the other Federals, there's some Eastern Theater Federals over here. That's right, Eastern Theater got out here. That is the 8th Michigan and 79th New York, veterans of First Bull Run, Secessville, uh, Antietam, stuff like that. Their camp is going to be on the bluffs over here. 
until finally it is known to the Federals that John Hunt Morgan is raiding into Kentucky. Uh, Colonel Orlando H. Moore expects that John Hunt Morgan is possibly going to be coming to test men, and he's going to prepare during those three days that Gettysburg's going on uh, to defend what little part is known as the Narrows. Those Eastern Theater guys, they're going to also defend this bluff right over here. That's the 8th Michigan and 79th New York, about 40 men uh, from those two regiments. Good, good. Okay, so... The Union soldiers are getting ready. John Hunt Morgan's getting ready to just probably roll over him because he's John Hunt Morgan. He's got a big force here. Um, and then, you know, the Southerners arrive on the scene. Let's just take it, take a little further, man. You know, let's get into the fight itself. How do so few Union soldiers repel the legendary John Hunt Morgan? So there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes in John Hunt Morgan's high command. Uh, during the earlier stages, literally the couple stages, early days of this raid, uh, Tom, uh, sorry, Quirk's scouts, who is an elite scouting unit, Captain Quirk is going to be severely wounded at a little small skirmish uh, during the first parts of this raid. Then in the battle at Columbia, Kentucky on July the 3rd, the replacement for Captain Quirk is going to be wounded. And then you're going to have a young lieutenant called Tom Franks, who's going to take command of this elite scouting force for John Hunt Morgan. He's going to come over here at Tev's Bend. Again, this is his first time ever doing any kind of scouting mission, commanding a scouting company, trying to figure out where the Federals are, what they're doing, so on and so forth. He's going to do a very poor job for the Confederates, and it's going to make John Hunt Morgan believe that he can easily steamroll these Confederates whenever he attacks. And so the fighting here is going to start up at around 4 o'clock early morning. You're going to have skirmishes, those guys trying to figure out where everybody's at, what they're doing, what they're going towards, if you will. Then towards about 6 o'clock, John Hep Morgan, famously as he usually does, will roll up his artillery and start firing on the federal positions. Now one key interesting thing, which I encourage you, if you ever come to Ted Finn, you'll know what I'm talking about. The Confederate artillery positions can only see the rifle pit that, John, that Colonel Orlando H. Moore built. It's a trap that Moore has laid for the Confederates. He wants John Hep Morgan to attack him because if he does, he, he's going to make John Hep Morgan bleed for every single step that he takes here at Tep's Bend. Yeah, and, and if I may, you know, you're, what you're talking about is so interesting here. I've never been here. I'm learning a lot about the battle right now. But not only, so you have troops that are here, and some of these same troops that have been at Manassas, Antietam, in South Carolina, at Secessionville, and out here. I mean, this has got to be eye-opening for you. I mean, sometimes you hear about someone going east and west. People going east, west, and south, that's pretty cool stuff. And then there's this idea of, you know, sort of not only setting up entrenchments, but here, at the same time that Vicksburg is falling, you know, the Union soldiers have Abatee out in front of their position. They're trying to make Morgan pay, so they're going to set this up, use the experience elsewhere in the war in order to make this as tough as possible. And it's that experience that Orlando H. Moore is going to use that he's knowing because earlier in the war, earlier, earlier than that, he participated in what was known as the Mormon War. Uh, little small raids by Mormon militia that cuts off Union supply trains. So Orlando H. Moore is used to this kind of stuff. He's used to face against all odds, against large numbers of enemy. And he's preparing for this. He's ready to go. Whenever John Hunt Morgan attacks, he wants him to bleed again. That's what he wants out here, and that's going to happen. Right, and let me just take a brief break to talk about, you know, Taylor had mentioned, if you, we hope you come to Tebs Bend. If you come to Tebs Bend, well, happily, the Ten, Tebs Bend Battlefield Association, if I got the name right, you know, owns some acreage here. Not just five acres, not ten. Is it 150 acres or something like that? Like a third of the whole battlefield uh, that was fought here, and a lot of it is off in that, that direction over there. So uh, in coming here right away, you see wayside, uh, you know, markers, interpretive markers. You see some directional signers to tell you what's going on. On. These signs, trust me, at the trust, you know, we interpret battlefields too. These are not cheap. They need some support. So right after you support the American Battlefield Trust and our youth leadership team, make sure you support the Tebbs Bend Battlefield Association here. Now, when I turn it over to Taylor here, I guess this will be fast because certainly someone like John Hunt Morgan would know when he's up against a tough position and only attack once. Is that right, Taylor? Sadly, no. Uh, there, we have been able to record that there were seven Confederate attacks repeatedly one after the other against Moore's line. Each and every single time, they fail horribly here at Tebbs Bend. Morgan's entire command will suffer because of those seven attacks. It's horrible what happens here. And it's not only until one of the Confederate attacks finally opens up here that John Hunt Morgan realizes something's a little bit off about this. These Federals are actually staying here and fighting. 
Now, one interesting thing to note that most people don't really know whenever they come here to Tep's Bend. Whenever the Confederates attack, they only, most of the Confederate officers at that time reported their men only carrying about five to seven rounds. This battle lasts about four hours. Seven rounds can't get you to about four hours. Now, the Federals, though, they're a much different story. They realize the stakes here at Tep's Bend. They realize that there are no Federals within a 30-mile radius around them. They know that they can't retreat because if they do, Colonel Orlando H. Moore will lose his commission as a colonel. They'll also be possibly surrounded by John Hunt Morgan's cavalry and slaughtered. So they know that they have to stay here and fight to the death. Now they, as far as ammunition goes, they have tons of it. They can load, unload as much lead as they possibly can in a short amount of time. I'm sure you all are possibly hearing those rifles. I think that was some of Morgan's stuff there that I heard there. Um, keep it going. Let's take this to the end here. What does Morgan do? Uh, does he give up eventually? So it's only after one huge climactic event. You know, all battles have that. So it's towards the last attack. Okay, so John Hunt Morgan is almost surrounding this little small 170 federal man force out here. He's going to look at David W. Chenault one of the greatest men in John Hunt Morgan's cavalry. Tons of men looked up to him. He was a native of Lexington. And actually, the cool thing is that he joined the Confederate service after the big battle at Richmond, Kentucky. And so a lot of those Confederates that joined into the 11th Kentucky, which Chenault commanded, were also joining up after the big battle at Richmond. So kind of speed it up. John Hunt Morgan looks at Chenault and tells him, flank that federal force. So Chenault's going to go down into one of the valleys over here, which again, if you come out here to test in, you'll know what I'm talking about. So they go down to this valley. This is on the Confederate left, Federal right. Chenault, his entire force, the 11th Kentucky, has about 400 to 500 Confederates, by far one of the largest Confederate regiments out here at Tebbs Bend. Chenault is going to lead this last ditch effort up this huge valley. Colonel Orlando H. Moore is going to look to his right, see Chenault coming up the valley. There's about 500. They said that they were screaming like tons of Confederates would do. You know, that big rebel yell. Um, they said it looked like locusts coming everywhere up to them with their butternut jackets and so on and so forth. So again, this big climactic attack. Orlando H. Moore is going to look to Company I under Debeau. I like to call them Debeau's Dutchmen because the majority of them are Dutchmen, literally, immigrants. And so he's going to look to Debeau about 60 men in that company, tells them to fix bayonets, expand out as skirmishers because that 500 man force is about to overlap Orlando H. Moore's line. He tells Debo to literally just charge down that ridge line like a 20th main charge, you know, at Gettysburg. He, Debo orders his men not to fire until the Confederates are within less than 30 yards. And by this point, the majority of the Confederates here, their ammunition is expended. They're done. They have no more bullets to fire back at the Federals. So whenever these Federals unload on those Confederates attacking, tons of them drop. Chenault, while he's trying to lead his men, because they're about to break the Federal line over here, Chenault, while he's leading his men, will be grievously shot right in the head, dies instantly. Immediately, the 11th Kentucky, those men lose heart in this fight, fall back down the ridge, and by that point, Colonel Moore... General Morgan, by this point, hears a bugle. He thinks that there's reinforcements coming. That's a whole other story. And pulls back the Confederates from the Battle of Tebbs Bend. Wow. That's great stuff. I just learned a whole lot here. This is really great. You know, and let me just say, uh, there's some sort of a vehicle on the top that if this were a tour, you wouldn't be listening to me at all. You'd just be watching that thing, see if it's going to come tumbling down the ridge there. You know, uh, you know, I, we got someone here in our 50s, someone here in our 30s, someone here in our teens. And, you know, you know, I just want to say that there are a lot of people, a lot of young people, you know, maybe not enough that are Taylor's age, but a lot of young people who are really interested in this. And you can help with this. You can, you know, I hope you already are. Use our itineraries. Take some of your kids and grandkids to the battlefields. OK, get them enthused you know do a little bit more than their teachers do see if your teachers can teach these subjects a little bit more especially as we approach the 250th anniversary of our great country uh, where I think there will be all eyes on our history and whatnot and in a positive story I think as well so um, let me just ask Taylor is there anything else you want to say about the association or about this battlefield that people have to know so currently right now we're in these steps we're not fully there yet but we are in the steps of slowly but surely preserving a federal hospital. We'll cut, you all will know more in the coming months. It's known as the Sublet House, but we're slowly but surely about to start the preservation efforts for that hospital that was used after the battle here at Tebbs Bend.
Great. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Taylor. I think we're in Taylor County, Kentucky as well, if I'm correct. It must be named after him or something like that. So, um, you know, thanks so much for joining us. You might see Taylor a little bit more while we're on this trip as well. Um, thanks to Chris White behind the camera. And it, it, Chris will shake the camera this way if he disagrees with you. But I'd love to show everybody the river, maybe in a moment of zen as we take it out. Thanks for uh, supporting Battlefield Preservation. Let's take a quiet walk over there.